Um, without further ado, and only uh, four minutes later than originally planned, um, I'd like to welcome Frances Bell and thank her very much for being the first really full-time guest speaker on the First Steps into Learning and Teaching, discussing the role of openness by academics in the transformation of their teaching and learning practices. Uh, over to you, Frances. Hi, thanks George and welcome to everybody this afternoon. It's really exciting to be involved in this MOOC. Um, I love to see the experimentation with MOOCs because I know how important they've been to me um, in, the, in the changing of my own teaching and learning practices. So um, I asked you to um, read a blog post about publication, about um, comparing publication in blogs and journal articles because that's something I'm really interested, not just as, um, as an academic, but also because I'm the editor of Research and Learning Technology, the Association of Learning Technologies journal that went um, open access from January this year. Um, but, but actually, this afternoon, I'm going to take a slightly different perspective. Um, and we can come back to talk about that post at the end of this time, because it occurred to me that the subject of your MOOC is about learning and teaching, so we, would, we could look at those open practices uh, in some details. You'll notice that I've said that this um, presentation is by me and the participants. That's because I'm going to try and reduce to a minimum the amount of speaking that I do and hopefully to maximize the amount of speaking, typing in the chat room, writing on slides that, um, that you do. So basically, I, I asked you to look at four questions. If you haven't looked at them, don't feel uh, inhibited from having a go at answering them this afternoon anyway. But uh, I'll, I'll make a few brief initial remarks and give you a couple of examples. And then we'll go into discussing those four questions. So um, George, can, you, can I move the, onto the next slide? Oh, yes, I can. OK. Right. Um, this first image is makes me think about some things that are happening in um, physical architecture of learning spaces, but also virtual learning spaces, which of course have their own architecture anyway. <coughs> when I drive back from Salford, which is unusual because I normally get the train, I drive past um, Manchester Metropolitan University's business school, which has a big uh, building of teaching rooms which look onto the urban motorway. And I just think it makes me smile thinking about glass walls being such a fashion in classrooms. Um, so let's just think for a few minutes about what happens in classrooms when th things and people on the outside are looking in. So we might have external speakers coming in. We might use um, blogs, wikis, Twitter that we put in an open area. Uh, we might have quality assurance inspectors coming in to have a look at us. We might do international collaborations. My first experience of the outside looking in was an interesting one. Um, I was posting my teaching materials and encouraging, encouraging students to engage in dialogue on a Lotus Notes system. And I didn't actually realize that these um, pages were, were resolved to web pages. So the outside was looking in at me initially without me even knowing that that was happening. Um, but it was really exciting and led to a real interest in what, what you could do with the web and open spaces. So I think the thing that I'd like to mention at this point, for those of you who are um, developing in your own teaching and learning, is that it's very important as a teacher, I have found, to learn how to engage in the behaviors that I want my students to engage in so that I can model them effectively, not to be an expert, but so that I can model them. OK, the next image is from a, a Victorian, I suppose, um, primary school, which is now a museum. And I have a very early memory of being in a classroom in Scotland where the windows were rather like they are in this classroom. And I, I don't know this for a historical fact, but I can only imagine that the children in the school 
were sitting there and they didn't have low windows because they could only they weren't distracted by people who were walking past on the pavement they could only look at the sky and one of my early memories was of being told off for being what used to be called a daydreamer because I was always looking out looking at the sky um, but I think that this is a very important aspect of um, openness of practice is even if we're on the inside even if we're in a safe space with our students we should definitely still be looking out um, as well as thinking about other people looking in to see what we're doing so that made me think about um, because it often seems to me that there's nothing much new is how classrooms have always been a window on the world and I think that what's interesting to think about this is that even if teachers and students were physically confined within a classroom they could be out there in the world by means of ideas and communication so on the left hand side thinking about younger children they'd be listening to stories maybe telling them they'd be learning to read which is a fantastic way of becoming more open in our thinking and our knowledge they might go on school trips they might um, engage in works of art which are then shown maybe just to the parents on parents evening or you know to other people who come into the school show and tell I remember the uh, nature table when I was a little girl bringing things in that we found at the weekend the um, in, in, a, in an internet age the, the opportunity to have film images and text is just so much more rich and powerful than it was students engage in live projects whether um, physically or in a virtual setting they go on work placements we now have international classrooms which might be international collaborations or it might be that we have a wonderful mix of international students coming into our classrooms so now it's over to you guys and I'm going to um, in a moment I'm going to put down the microphone so that anybody who wants to can pick it up um, and then I'll move on to another the next slide where you can start to write on it if you want but what I'm really interested is to hear the ideas of this group about how they think openness can benefit their practice if you're interested in this image by the way it's um, it's a sculpture on a beach in Vik in southern Iceland and there's a mirror of it um, off the uh, Yorkshire coast in England and these two these two uh, sculptures are looking across the ocean at each other and I have to tell you that's a very open spot that uh, I took that that uh, that uh, picture very open windy and breezy most of the year but very beautiful so guys it's over to you I hope you're going to contribute and tell us how you think openness can benefit your practice okay
some really nice examples coming up here on the slide. I'm picking up the sense that um, there's a sense of connection, because it can be quite lonely being a teacher in the classroom, and also a sense of learning. And I, I agree with those. Feel free to pick up the mic, anyone who's got a mic available. Hello? Hello? Hi, Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Hi. Yeah, good. Um, just say hello, really. Testing, I suppose. Like the board. Great, great. Hi. Hi. I think that's really, think that's really, that's really great. Really great. Yeah. Lucy, do you Lucy, think you, do you could turn, turn, turn the mic up? Right. I think we'll move on to the next question now. But that, that's really great. And I hope you'll follow up some of these points in the discussion forum. OK. So the next point that I wanted to talk about was how what risks are presented by Open, open academic practice. And um, just to make a, I hope, I hope it's not a superficial connection to the topic of your work this week about groups, I am on record as, you know, being quite dubious about the distinction between groups and networks that uh, Stephen Downs introduced in 2006, because I think things are rarely that simple. And I don't really have anything too much against groups or networks come to that. But um, I think there's a time and place for everything. And I think that one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is when to be open and when to be less open or open in slightly different ways. And uh, I think that's an issue that occurs in group and teamwork. So um, I just wondered if any of you had any examples or thoughts on what risks are presented by open academic practice. Hey everyone, it's Sylvia here. It looks like hey, um, it's Sylvia here. okay, they're back now. Okay, they're back. Now. I just wanted to make sure nobody else was just checking the global sure permissions. We're okay. okay. The tools are back. We're okay. The tools are back.
just saying hi to Aslan who's just arriving. Hi, can you hear me now? Okay, did you hear what I was saying about power relations? I must have got a bit confused with the um, with the microphone. Okay, I'll say that again then, Jenny. Right, what I was saying was that um, one of the things I think about the risks of openness are that we almost have to pretend that there are no problems with it. And I, I don't agree with that. I mean, the groups and networks thing was um, was something that I think I spoke about earlier, where I, I don't believe that openness is an uh, um, it's a, it's not something that is completely appropriate in every occasion. To me, it's just I think we should be thinking more about how we use openness, when to be open, when not to be open. So perhaps, it, as a, to paraphrase, we should be as open as we possibly can. Okay, can you hear me now? Right, apologies. I don't know what's wrong with my sounds, but I've just abandoned the headphones and I'm just trying with the microphone on the, on here. But yeah, thank you very much for all these really interesting points that um, that you that that you, that you're raising on here. And I mean, the, the the idea of openness in our academic practice is very attractive and very rich and powerful, but it, I don't think it should become a mantra, really, in what I'm saying, is what I'm saying. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Has everybody finished what they're saying there? Okay, let's go. Right, this question is about, um, let me get to it is about the impact of participation in um, SSLT12 on your own personal networks. Now, you're not very far into this MOOC, but I think often that the, the first MOOC that I really got involved with was CCK08 with um, George Siemens and Stephen Downs. And I've got some really valuable people in my network, some of them here today, hello, Heli, um, who I met through CCK08. And I think that that's something to really think about, that how can you build your network via this MOOC? I feel sure that you are already and will continue to build some really valuable nodes in your network um, via participation in this MOOC. And I just wonder if that is happening to you already um, or whether you've experienced it before and if you've got any comments that you'd like to share with us about this.
Perhaps this is a difficult question to ask at this stage in the uh, MOOC because it's early days. Perhaps I should come back and ask you later um, because networks take a while to... to um oh. Um, hi, I'm not quite sure if uh, I, I was not quite sure about moderating, but I was just putting my hand up, Francis, to say so noticing some of the comments there and people talking about it being a new and daunting experience, so much going on, so much information, so hard to keep track of and to follow a conversation. And I think that is um, partly in relation to the previous screen, that is one of the the risks of openness. And I think that the open academic practice, and particularly the massive open online form, the, the MOOC form, is a uh, challenge to, uh, to e-learning, to open academic practice generally. That uh, there, there could well be some uh, uh, limits being tested here. and. Um, openness uh, of this sort not necessarily serving everybody's purpose all the time. I think we do run into problems when we tend to, when we see things as being universal. And you know, if it's good for me, therefore it's good for everyone. And, and clearly that's not the case. Uh, sorry, I should put my hand back down. Francis, uh, are you having uh, problems with, with your microphone? I see your microphone isn't on. Can you turn your microphone on and try to talk again? Can you hear me now, George? Yes, I certainly can. Can you hear me? Yes, I yes. certainly oh, can. Okay, okay, that's fine. Oh, right, I've um, taken my headphones out. That's why I was turning off my microphone in between times so you didn't get feedback. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is really interesting. I, I tried to find my way around this MOOC a bit, and I felt a similar sense of disorientation that I found in other MOOCs that I've been involved in. I think it's just sort of the geography is actually a bit of an issue. It's very difficult to tie up all these channels together, and sometimes you feel you're always in the wrong place. But I'm sure we'll learn more about that as we go along. This one's quite good really, but you know, you still think, oh, where is that? I can't remember where it is. And I think those issues can be quite important. But one thing that I um did want to say is that the um a very important aspect I think is the back channel. And not just the back channel like you've got in the chat, which is an open back channel, but also the back channel that you have with little side conversations with people. And I think that can help people feel not too overwhelmed if they find a few mates that they can have a little chat with and see how they're getting on. So, you know, I think that mix of openness and uh, closeness can be quite useful. I don't know what other people think.
Hello, Francis. Hello, Francis. Have you turned off your... Have you hello turned off your... Hello, Francis. Can you hear me now? Yes, can hear you now. Is it, is it a question of remembering to click on the microphone button? Oh, I think I'm in binary mode of, um, of, of doing it the wrong way around. You can hear me now. Yes, can hear you now. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, so here we've got Zuckerberg. Uh, you know, we could think of him as the poster boy for openness. Well, he certainly learned at school. He learned to set up the Facebook um, business when he was at Harvard Business School. And, and uh, you know, we could say, with what's happened to him in the last week that he's probably still learning on Wall Street because uh, he fell off the billionaires list um, this morning. So, uh, th so um, you know, I wonder, you know, that in some ways the enemy of openness, I would say, or using openness as an enemy for those of us whose uh, data he's been trying to make billions out of. Um, but let's think of it in terms of our learners' practice. Can we think of the role that openness can play in learners' practice. Um, some of you know my colleague Helen Keegan, and she gives an example. I couldn't find it this morning when I was looking for it, but um, she has some examples of her students blogging openly and actually finding that um, expert practitioners have come in and commented on students' blogs and it gives them a wonderful sense of belonging to a, a community of practice that extends beyond education into their professional lives and so on. So, um, you know, can you think of any, any ways in which openness could play a part in your learner's practice? Um, any examples that you've got or ideas that you can um, think of for the future? Be really interesting to hear about it. Dagiri, yes, um, Facebook is open, but it's also closed. I think that the data that um, is is what's sold for advertising purposes is not necessarily open, um, and it's its closedness that can make it valuable. In the resources that um, I'm providing you with at the end of this slideshow, um, there's a paper that Helen Keegan and I wrote, a piece of research we did on a project she did with students um, where they were creating um, five-minute videos with their mobile phone and sharing them through, um, through YouTube. And it was really interesting to see um, the ways in which students were happy to be open, happy to be out there on YouTube, but not necessarily wanting to be seen as students, but as practitioners themselves, not just students.
Yeah, I'm good to, glad to see people picking on this idea of authenticity and um, real audiences and um, and the sort of public expression of stu students' ideas. Uh, I, I think it's really powerful. Obviously, a bit like people were saying earlier on, can be a bit daunting to be on this MOOC, but then it's similarly daunting for students. So we, I think we need to really support them in um, in their in their exposure to openness, but it's not a reason not to do it. Just maybe not to throw them in completely at the deep end. Some good points about assessment. Yeah, what what's the ethics of um, having openness when it comes to assessment? How do we cope with that? Something that struck me in the last couple of years from uh, watching students start to use Twitter, where from three years ago hardly any of them used it to quite a lot of them using it now, is the um, something that I think very much appeals to our young learners is the idea that you can go out and get your questions answered. And they think that's really interesting and appealing. And what I've found quite a challenge is to um, show students that the quality of the answers that you get back depends on the strength of your network. So if you have contributed to that network, you're much more likely to get some good answers back. And um, that's all start of, that's all part of uh, learners learning how to become an effective member of a network and to build their network and invest in it so that they can regain some return on their investment. That's an interesting point about openness being a godsend for students not being fully catered for. And I know later in this course you're going to look a lot at um, open educational resources. I didn't really talk about that in this present, in this session because I, I know you're going to get a lot of it coming back later on. But it is really interesting to look at open educational resources and the different way in which they're produced and consumed. Sometimes the people who produce those um, open educational resources in broadcast mode, you don't really get the feeling that they're consuming anyone else's resources. So, you know, I think there's a few questions to ask about that. A few points there about open journal access, and I think that when we move on to the next slide, we might uh, start to um, start to talk about that. Yep, some excellent points coming here. Really good. Yes, the Acora is um, a 
Web 2.0 service that specifically does that. But I think people also do it on Twitter as well, and 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 perhaps that's slightly different when they're operating more within their own their own networks. Okay, I think we might be running out of space on this slide, so let, let, let's have a look at what next. Are there any last thoughts that anybody wants to bring up? Anything that we haven't covered so far? I know I asked you to do the reading about comparing blog posts and journals, which was a, a slightly different perspective on academic practice. So um, positioning ourselves as academics with a, an, an open identity, um, that's um, I don't know if any of you had any comments that arose from that or any last thoughts that you've got yourself. Yes, Marion? Yes, Marion? There was a question from the chat um, from this year who wants to know what call was. There was a question from the chat. Uh, there was a question from the chat. Quora, Quora is um, a site where you can post questions and people will answer them. It's a bit like in a social network set setting where you can follow people and then they manipulate the feeds to put the most popular answers to the top and so on. Um, I don't know if somebody can find a link to it and put it. Oh, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. You put uh, a link to Quora in there. But I think you can use your own networks in the same way, like Twitter and Facebook and so on. Thank you. Thank you. I like the picture. Yeah, um, I wonder if um, if colleagues who are under threat of uh, losing their jobs, as many of my colleagues are, and myself at the moment, are thinking about that point about um, putting your materials on the web. I mean, probably if you, I, I put loads of my stuff on the web. I even put some of my lecture notes on SlideShare. My, my SlideShare is on SlideShare, and then post them back into Blackboard, which always makes me smile when I think about the outside coming into Blackboard. Um, yeah, they could chase you for the IPR, I suppose, but I think that if everybody is as open as, open as, as they feel able to be, then it would be too much work to chase it all. Have you got any thoughts about your own um, identity as an open academic? Is this something that anybody's thought about? Yes, Francis, this is Jenny speaking. Francis, this is Jenny speaking. Um, I think you probably know that um, I've done a little bit of publishing and my approach is has been to try and publish to open journals as much as possible. Um, it raises all sorts of interesting issues and I think being new to publishing I'm particularly interested in the issues it raises. One of the issues for example is how much of what you are going to try and publish can you discuss up front on your blog say beforehand. How much can you get it peer reviewed by your colleagues before you send it in for publication and you being an editor of alt I'd be interested in your um, perspective on that. I think it's a really good point. I mean, what I've noticed over the last few years is that it used to be the case that people would publish a draft of a paper at a conference and they'd get feedback, they might hand out paper copies, but only the abstracts might appear in um, a, 
an open, a digitally published document on a website. But now increasingly it's so easy to publish. Everything gets published. And, and I think it's a bit of a pity because if someone had put in um, a paper to a conference and then they wanted to improve it and put it into um, put it into a journal, then because they're all open, that could be picked up by the reviewers and you know might be seen to be a bit of a problem. And I think we really need, need to try and get ourselves sorted out in this area and decide what is acceptable, you know, putting in acknowledgments, will, will that be all right? As an editor, I only have so much power. I'm at the mercy of um, the reviewers. So it's really the what's acceptable practices have to be determined within the community of um, readers, authors, reviewers, editors. So it's, I know that's not a great answer, Jenny, but no, um, thanks. I, thanks. I do think it's something that we need to be thinking about. And I don't think no, that thanks. open access thanks. is unresolved. Do you want to respond, Jenny? Um, yes, I, th I think there are lots of difficulties around, and I, th I think it does it, and will affect people who are being pushed by their institutions to publish a lot, and at the same time moving towards openness. Um, I think there are many dilemmas there. I don't have any answers. I've come up against a few of the problems myself uh, in wanting to get a lot of feedback before publication and yet feeling very wary about how open I can be in case it does actually affect the acceptance of the paper. So some, there's a tension there in publishing between openness and publishing and getting your published record behind you, which is important for an academic. I'm sure many of you know Christina Costa, who's a colleague of mine at Salford, and she also happens to be um, doing a PhD under my advice, I wouldn't say supervision. Um, and she, she's doing some research in this area, and it's really, really interesting. You know, there are so many opportunities for openness, but it's not without its difficulties. I mean, if a PhD student of mine came and asked me about how open they should be, I'd say, you know, be more careful with your data until you've got it published in a um, in a more traditional uh, forum then um, you know talking about your ideas is one thing but um, publishing your data too early I think is something else but maybe I'm just being a bit conservative there okay some really great uh, ideas uh, sorry Francis, is it okay to ask a question Please go ahead. It's Pat Kenny here. Um, I'm, uh, as I think I've written on the board a couple of times, just really uh, coming to terms with um, with all of the information that potentially can make itself available. And in thinking about the points that you're raising in relation to open educational resources, the the, uh, the question that keeps popping into my mind, and I hope this is not too simplistic a question. Um, it's about the motivation. Why would you want to be publishing all that stuff in the open environment? You've, you've made reference to the challenges of um, uh, trying to have material research published in the traditional journals, and I completely understand that. Um, at the same time, you were saying that you, and I, I, I've seen this myself, you publish loads and loads of things of stuff out on the internet. For me, I'm kind of wondering um, what the motivation, what's the driver behind this open educational resource thing? Um, I mean, I'm not really a huge expert on open educational resources. I know a bit more about open access in journals, although I suppose I have um, published a lot of my own stuff as open openly. I wouldn't label them as open educational resources. Maybe it's what um, someone who wrote a blog post about it. it wasn't it wasn't Martin from the OU? It was somebody else who called them big ORs and little. OERs. But um, 
I think that one of the arguments is that if we create knowledge, it, it could be with the intention that it's a, as widely available as possible. And another argument could be that if public bodies like research funders and um, GISC and different people um, invest money in the creation and publication of knowledge, it should be available to as many people as possible. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, right. We'll move on to the um, to the last slide, and unless and if anyone wants to say anything, pick up the mic, say any any last things, please do so. Okay, so this the thought I'd like to share with you at the end of this talk probably won't come as much of a surprise because it's a summary of what I've been saying, is that I prefer to think of openness as really being a default option that you can turn off. So I'm not saying that we should always be open, but that we should always consider whether or not we can be open. But I really don't like the idea of it as being a zealous precept that everything has to be open. You know, you don't necessarily want to publish ch uh, pictures of your children or grandchildren um, publicly online. You might want to share them in a space. But in terms of your open academic practice, I think you should really experiment with openness, apply it as required, take a few risks, not too many risks, and learn from your experience and you know encourage your students to do the same, but to support them and obviously that works a lot better if you've had experience of openness before you get your students to engage in it too so um, any last thoughts anyone else has? I'd love to hear what you've got to say. If I can come in on the audio briefly and I put it into the uh, chat stream there. Um, Anne Cunningham, uh, and I can't, don't have the link to hand, but she uh, uh, reported on a correlation between social media participation. I.e., academics who blog a lot are also the academics who get cited a lot. This was in medical research. Um, <coughs> So I, I don't know if it goes uh, across the, the, all of the academic spectrum, but there is a strong positive correlation between active in the social media streams and being highly cited in high, um, high quality journals. So there is, a, there is a positive feedback. Back to Pat Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy, that might be one of the motivations for engaging in openness for a research active academic. But there are so many dimensions of openness. Uh, in two weeks' time, Dave White is going to join us. Uh, I think that's right, two weeks' time, yeah, the, the final of the uh, guest speakers to talk particularly about open educational resources. And o OERs, uh, big and small, if, uh, if we take uh, Martin Waller's categorization, are um, interesting and problematic phenomenon. I think uh, if you've been following the chat, Fred Garnett has said, some commentary on uh, open academic uh, resources, OERs. I think OERs, in the strong sense, are um, not nearly as open as people might think they are, but that's just um, a contentious point that I'd like to, to make. I find uh, open, open, academic, open educational resources defined in terms of uh, licensing regimes, repositories, and deployment through um, learning management systems is uh, really quite uh, quite a challenge for me, but uh, maybe that's just because uh, I can't be bothered with all that metadata. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll hang up after that one. Well, actually, um, I think that that's really quite a nice place to start to bring it to a close. And I, it's always nice to leave the audience with something to do. And um, I noticed in the chat that uh, it, Martin Weller was referred to as the person who wrote about big and little OERs. And I'm not going to go off and check just now, but I'm pretty sure that Martin Weller wrote about the blogger who wrote about big and little OERs 
which in itself is a really nice tie back to what we were saying about power relations earlier on, that there is a real danger in um, open academic practice that ideas get misconnected and I, I, I'm not in any sense accusing Martin Weller of doing that, but because he's a bigger name than the person who wrote about them in the first place, the idea then becomes associated with him. So that perhaps could be um, a point to discuss on another occasion. So um, with that, uh, here are some references. The, in fact, in this paper, this YouTube as a repository paper, I do cite the person who wrote about big and little OERs. So um, you can go and start looking there or look on Martin's blog or whatever. But I've forgotten the name of the person who wrote about them, but I think it was Martin writing about their work. Okay. So anyway, I'd like to thank you very much for being my co-creators this afternoon. And what I'm going to do, um, unless somebody objects, um, let me know, is I'm going to take the images of the screens that you, uh, where you wrote, and I'm going to superimpose them back on the PowerPoint slideshow. So if you felt that you were operating under Chatham House rules and you want your stuff removing, just let me know. Um, but um, if I don't hear from you, you will be published. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Francis. If everybody notices um, under the participants list where there's those smiley faces, one of the options uh, is to click on applause. So if everybody can find their applause button, click on the applause button and give Francis a round of thank you in, the, in as they say, the usual manner. Um, that, ooh, ding, 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 ding. Um, I suspect that that's the uh, hand raising bell that's being used extensively rather than the applause button, but uh, I think we get the idea. Francis, thank you very much for your presentation. I uh, look forward to seeing the, uh, the, the ones that are, are added in. Um, yes, <laughs> lots, of, lots of pressing the hand raising. Um, but you can, if you see the smiley face, underneath the smiley face there is also something that says applause, and you can uh, and you can give a round of applause.